So our next speaker is Andrea Feldman, who will speak about uh, approximate uh, kernels for standard network problems. And, uh, Thanks. Uh, uh, yes, so my topic is uh, related to the uh, tutorial this morning, right? Uh, so I combine approximation with uh, kernelization and it's uh, about a set of problems that, de that are sort of er derived from uh, this problem that I'm sure uh, most of you know, so the standard tree problem. Uh, so I'm given some uh, undirected graph with some edge weights and a special set of vertices which are called terminals which are these boxes in, in my pictures. And now I want to find a connected, uh, well, I want to find a tree, let's say, that connects all of the uh, terminals, contains all of the terminals, and I want to minimize the total weight of that uh, tree. Okay, now uh, we know since a long time that this uh, problem is NP-hard, uh, so we cannot really hope to solve it in polynomial time. Uh, so what do we do? Well, uh, there are several things, right? We can either compute approximations or uh, use parameterized al uh, algorithms or kernelizations or we can maybe combine uh, the two, right? Which is the topic uh, here. So let me first talk a little bit about uh, approximation. Uh, so um, it's not hard to get a two approximation for this uh, problem. So all you do is you take uh, the metric closure on the terminals, compute a minimum spanning tree, and then it's an easy exercise to show that this is a two approximation. And for quite some time, this was like the best approximation factor that uh, people could show until the mid 90s when there was sort of a new tool that people came up with. Uh, which uh, in the end led to, um, well, it's maybe not the end, but um, up to today anyway, the best approximation uh, factor we know of uh, is, is this one here, ln4 plus epsilon. And the tool that it uses to get below factor of two is this uh, Boyce's and Du uh, theorem, okay? And it turns out that this uh, tool is also quite useful to, to get uh, kernels. Okay, but before I go to this, um, so I just wanted to say, okay, so the problem is also APX hard, so uh, we cannot really hope to get an approximation scheme in polynomial time. All right, so what about uh, parameterization? So, of course, it depends what parameter we're talking about. A uh, well-studied parameter in this setting is the number of terminals, and then there's this classic result of Dreyfus and Wagner, which gives you an FPT algorithm. Um, now, it makes sense to also look at uh, sort of a different parameter uh, in the setting, which is sort of dual to this, uh, which is the number of Steiner vertices in the optimum uh, solution. And okay, it's not hard to get an XP algorithm here, because all you have to do is to guess which uh, Steiner vertices are going to be in your optimum solution, add the terminals, compute a minimum spanning tree, and that's, and that's it, right? And the number of choices of these uh, Steiner vertices uh, is, is this, so that gives you the, the running time. Now you can ask yourself, can you uh, do better than these algorithms? And uh, okay, so first of all, uh, the Dreyfus and Wagner algorithm, there is a faster version, uh, which gives you, uh, yeah, so the base of the exponent can be arbitrarily close to two if you want. Uh, but for the other parameter, the problem turns out to be uh, W hard. So yeah, we cannot really hope for an FPT algorithm here. All right, what about kernels? Uh, so if you look at the parameter number of terminals, then um, there is no polynomial sized kernel. While for the other parameter, well, it's W2 hard, so of course there is no kernel whatsoever. Um, good, and this is where sort of the combination of the two worlds comes into play. And well, we've seen this this morning, but just so that we're on the same page here, uh, we're talking about optimization problems now, right? So um, we have a reduction algorithm, which essentially computes the, the kernel given your input instance, but then you also have to go the other way around. Um, so uh, given a solution to the kernel, you have this lifting algorithm which computes a solution to the original instance, but it only loses a small factor in the solution quality. And if you can bound this, um, this loss by alpha, then we call this an alpha, well, this would be an alpha approximate uh, pre-processing algorithm. But then if the size of the, of the output instance is bounded as a function of input uh, parameter, then this is an alpha approximate kernel. 
right? And then the usual things. So if uh, this uh, function that bounds the size is a polynomial, then we call it an alpha approximate polynomial sized kernel. And okay, the, longs, the names get longer and longer. And in fact, if, uh, if alpha, if the approximation factor can be arbitrarily close to one, then we call it a polynomial sized approximate kernelization scheme or a PSAX for short. Good. Um, yes, so, and the observation that was already made in the uh, Lossy Kernels uh, paper is that this tool, the uh, Bosch's and Do theorem, leads to a PSAX for the parameter number of uh, terminals, okay, of, of this uh, size here. And in some work that we did in, in uh, Prague, um, we showed that for the other parameter, actually, uh, the same tool essentially also leads to uh, PSAX for, uh, yeah, for the other parameter, the number of standard vertices in the optimum. And I want to show you a little bit about uh, this uh, second result here, how we, how we get this um, thing. Or actually, I think, no, first, first I'll tell you actually what this tool is. Okay. So what is the Bosch's and Do theorem? So uh, imagine you have the optimum standard tree, so this red thing here. And the idea is to decompose it into smaller uh, standard trees. Okay, so I define a full component as a subtree of your given tree T, for which all the leaves are terminals. Okay, and if I denote by R of T prime here is going to be the terminals in T prime. Uh, then the theorem now says the following. So pick any epsilon uh, greater than zero, take your optimum standard tree. Now there exists a set of uh, full components with uh, three properties. First of all, uh, each full component only uh, connects a small number of uh, terminals, so bounded in the, uh, by, by a function of epsilon. Then if you take the union of all of these full components, you get the, uh, the original tree back. And the third property is that these full components actually overlap only very little. So in the sense that if you take the total sum of the weights of these full components, you're off by only an epsilon fraction from the tree you started out with that you decomposed in this way. All right, so now, uh, yeah, how do you, how do you use this uh, theorem? Um, so the first step is always some sort of uh, simplification of the input in some sense. So what you do is you take uh, every subset of terminals that is small, depending on epsilon, and you just compute an optimum standard tree uh, for that small subset. Uh, and you, you can use some uh, FPT algorithm for this, right? Um, and now by the uh, previous theorem, we know that the set of uh, pre-computed uh, standard tree contains some subset, which, is, uh, which together forms a good approximation of the, of the optimum. And okay, the running time uh, up to now is uh, given by this expression. So I mean, for every subset, for every small subset of terminals, you invoke your FPT algorithm. And if you do the math, you get uh, this running time, which up to this point is still a polynomial if epsilon is a constant, right? And now, uh, if you want polynomial time approximation, this is where you start to uh, do some um, use some very clever techniques. Uh, for example, here, for this lawn 4 approximation, you find a good subset of these pre-computed standard trees using some iterative rounding procedure. Uh, or, yeah, uh, as, as observed by uh, Lokshanov et al., uh, you can now uh, take this union of uh, pre-computed standard trees and sparsify it, in a sense. Because, you know, if you take the union of all these pre-computed solutions, it's not a kernel yet. Uh, because there could be many Steiner vertices and also the weights of the edges uh, uh, have to be encoded in, as a function of the input parameter. But uh, you can, it's not too hard to, to, uh, to sparsify the pre-computed standard trees yeah, so that you get a kernel uh, that now is a, is a PSAX, okay, because of the Bosch's and Do theorem. Okay, and uh, for the other parameter, the number of standard vertices in the optimum, what we do is uh, we have sort of a pre-processing that essentially reduces the number of terminals up to a point where uh, we can invoke this PSAX for the parameter number of uh, terminals. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how this pre-processing works now. 
Um, good, so in a nutshell, uh, you can sum it up as, up as follows. So we have this uh, one reduction rule essentially, which says that uh, pick a star of minimum ratio and add it to the solution. So what does that mean? Uh, so uh, I define the ratio of a, of a star. So I take a star for which all the leaves are terminals and the ratio is just the weight divided by the number of terminals in that star minus one. So it's like almost like the uh, average weight uh, of that star per, per terminal, but it's sort of skewed by this minus one, which in particular means that, so if you have two stars with the same average weight, then the minimum ratio one will be, be the one that has more terminals. Okay, that's on a, on a very intuitive level what's happening here. Um, and, okay, uh, it's not too hard to show that you can compute these stars of smallest ratio in, in uh, polynomial time. Okay, and now <clears throat> the algorithm is the following. Uh, so the reduction algorithm is the following. So as long as there are still many terminals left, so above some threshold tau, which in the end is some function of the input parameter in epsilon, okay, uh, we just find a star with smallest ratio. Uh, so for example, this, this red one here. And then we uh, contract it and make the resulting vertex a terminal. So like this. Okay, then we repeat. Uh, as long as there's still enough terminals, we take the next uh, star of smallest ratio in the remaining graph, uh, contract it and find a new uh, terminal. Yeah, and in the end, uh, we only have a few terminals left. I mean, as a function of the input parameter, and then we can run the PSAX for this parameter number of terminals. And uh, in the end, well, this, uh, these, uh, like the square and the to the four is essentially swallowed by the O notation. So you get essentially asymptotically the same size in the, uh, for, for this parameter. Okay. Uh, now we also need a lifting algorithm, right? Because we're in the approximation world. And the lifting algorithm is very simple. We essentially just uncontract all the stars, okay? So if this is the solution I'm given for the kernel, all I do is this. Oops, Oops. that was too fast. I, all I do is this, yeah? And I just output this for the, for the input graph. Okay, so now let me try to convince you why, or try to say a little bit at least about why this is a one plus epsilon approximate kernel. Um, yeah, so the idea is uh, sort of a very straightforward one if you're used to approximation algorithms. So we charge these constructed stars against uh, parts of the, of the optimum and make sure that we don't overcharge the optimum. Okay, so, if, uh, so the green part here is the, is the optimum, okay, and uh, now I have this first star that I'm contracting. Right, and when I'm contracting it, I'm removing, I can imagine I'm removing uh, some part of the optimum as well, okay, so like this. So some part of the optimum disappears, it's deleted from the, from the graph, and now I want to charge the cost of this uh, star, the red star, against the part of the optimum that I, that I removed. Okay, and I continue like this, uh, like this. so here's the second uh, star I'm contracting. I remove it, or I contract it, and then some part of the optimum disappears, so I I charge against this part of the optimum. And okay, in an ideal world, what I would have is that each of these contracted stars costs at most uh, one plus epsilon times the deleted part of the optimum. Okay, and then um, if you think about it for two minutes, then this would imply that you get a one plus epsilon uh, approximate kernel. The problem is that this is not always uh, the case. So here's a bad example. So I have this, um, this graph here, you have some very long edges of cost m. Uh, in the middle you have three edges of cost one and then you have these two edges of cost m half. And it's not too hard to see that this is the optimum, but which one is the uh, star of minimum ratio? Well, it turns out to be this one, okay? The star that has the two edges of costs m half. And yeah, if you do the math, you will see its uh, ratio is m, while any other star has strictly la uh, larger uh, ratio. And okay, so what would happen? I would contract this star, and uh, the optimum, uh, the deleted part of the optimum would only be one edge that costs one. Okay, so now the contracted star costs a lot more than what I'm trying to charge against in the, in the optimum. 
And so somehow my, my plan that I had earlier doesn't really work out. However, uh, there is a way around this because, uh, so note that in this example there are many, many terminals, okay? And this is essentially what saves us here. Um, so we have, now we have two types of, of uh, contractions, okay? So we have the bad contractions, which are these that overcharge the, the part of the optimum that I'm deleting. And the good contractions are those that cost at most one plus epsilon times the uh, part in the optimum uh, I'm deleting anyway, and those, those are sort of fine. And the key lemma that we prove now is that, well, as long as there are still uh, many terminals left, then the total cost of all the bad stars I'm contracting is only an epsilon fraction of the, of the optimum uh, Steiner tree. Okay, and then putting this together, we get, uh, we get our result. Okay. Um, good, so this is to get a kernel. You can also uh, use this uh, sort of pre-processing, uh, contracting these min ratio stars, and then just run an FPT algorithm on the, on the remaining graph for parameter number of terminals, and then you get an approximation scheme, a parameterized approximation scheme, uh, right, with this uh, running time here, because this is exactly the threshold of the, the number of terminals left in the end, so essentially this is just the running time for the uh, FPT algorithm in the end. Okay, um, good. So now, uh, what else can we say? So, I mean, uh, this, is, this seems to be a nice tool, so is there some uh, further direction into which we can uh, generalize uh, these, uh, these results? So let's look at directed graphs, okay? So directed Steiner tree problem, uh, the input is now directed. Uh, you have a terminal set and one special terminal, namely the root, that will be the blue guy here. Uh, and now you find trying to find a subgraph that contains a path from every terminal uh, to the root of minimum weight, uh, which gives you some. Uh, the optimum will always be a Steiner aberrescence, uh, like this, like this red uh, structure here. And um, okay, so here, okay, these are the results I, I just uh, showed you for the for the undirected case. So what about the directed case? And I mean, I showed you these tables actually on uh, Monday already, if you were here. So for the directed standard tree problem, okay, the, uh, the FPT algorithm uh, for number of terminals is, is the same. You can still do this. Uh, but as you saw this morning, f uh, there is no uh, constant approximate uh, polynomial kernel. And for the other parameter, number of standard vertices in the optimum, uh, we can show that uh, it's W1 hard to compute an f of k approximation for any uh, computable function f. And of course that also implies that there is no f of k approximate polynomial sized uh, kernel. Okay, but there's, um, and, and okay, essentially the reason for this is, uh, or yeah, in some sense is that there is no Bosch and do theorem because this theorem somehow always leads to these, uh, to a PSACs, okay? Fine, uh, then there is a special case though, which is the unweighted directed standard tree problem. And here, okay, so in terms of FPT algorithms, you can, uh, you can be uh, slightly faster than in the weighted case uh, because you can do a fast subset convolution. Uh, the, the reduction uh, for, the, for the polynomial kernel that you saw this morning can also be extended to the unweighted case. So again, no constant uh, approximate polynomial kernel. But now for the other parameter, something interesting happens because, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's a W2 hard problem, but there is actually a parameterized approximation uh, scheme using sort of the same pre-processing and then just running this uh, FPT uh, algorithm in the end. But in terms of polynomial kernels, uh, we can show that uh, there is definitely no better than two approximate kernels, so we have a lower bound. But yeah, we don't have a matching upper bound, and this was sort of the main open problem I presented on Monday. Um, I, was, I was quite excited about this. I mean, it would be really cool to show that there is a two approximate uh, polynomial kernel here. However, by now I'm a bit skeptical that this will uh, work out because usually, uh, I mean, we have this lower bound, okay, and usually this parameter is easier than this parameter. So now I'm not so sure that this will, I mean, I would, by now I would say that probably you can uh, prove like a similar lower bound as here at least. So that's, that's um, yeah, unfortunate. 
Okay, um, now in the remaining uh, time that I have, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, in to what directions we can generalize the Boisius and do uh, theorem. Okay, so is there is there some other uh, setting? Okay, so we saw that somehow directed uh, graphs in general don't really work, but uh, for the undirected setting, somehow uh, there is something like that. So how about we interpolate between these two settings? So how do we do that? Uh, so we define uh, bidirected graphs. Okay, so they're directed graphs. And they have the pro property that if you have an edge between u and v, or from u to v, then the reverse edge from v to u exists as well and has exactly the same length or weight. Yeah, so it's a directed graph, but it simulates sort of this property of undirected graphs where you can walk along a path in each direction and the length of this path is going to be the same in no matter what direction you, you go. Uh, but that's not the only thing I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm also going to interpolate between uh, two settings, namely planar input graphs and general input graphs. Okay, and how do I do that? So, um, uh, oh, okay, and one thing I also should not, uh, so, so I, I'm switching to sort of the directed setting of Steiner Forest now, okay? But let me just define the, the problem, okay? So the input is a bidirected graph. And uh, in addition, we're given a demand graph. So this is a, just a directed graph. So uh, this one here on only the terminal set. And it tells us what kind of connections we want. And now, um, even though the, the input is, uh, is well, it's bidirected, but otherwise unrestricted, I want to find a planar solution in there. Okay, this is my interpolation between planar inputs and, and general inputs, okay? And what do I want? I want a path from S to T for every directed edge in the demand graph. Of, uh, and I want this thing to be of minimum weight. Okay, so it's a little bit of a weird uh, problem, but the point is that this is how far I can push the Bosch and do theorem, essentially. And uh, no further than this, okay? So, um, yeah, first of all, uh, this problem is non-trivial, okay? So it turns out to be W1 hard for parameter number of terminals. Also APX hard, so no polynomial time approximation scheme. But we can show that there is a, a PSAX, okay? And exactly because we have this Bosch and do theorem, so what does our generalized theorem say? So uh, we're given, an, so pick any epsilon greater than zero, we're given now an optimum planar solution and a demand graph in some bidirected graph. And now there exists a set of uh, demand graphs such that first of all, each demand graph um, is on, on a subset of the given terminals and it only uses a small number of the terminals depending on epsilon again. Now, each of these demand graphs has a planar solution, and if I take the union, then this is a planar solution to the input's demand. And again, these planar solutions only overlap very little in the sense that if I take the total, if I sum up all the weights of these uh, planar solutions, I'm only an epsilon fraction away from the optimum uh, planar solution. Okay, and as a consequence of this, I get uh, I get a PSAX, and the, the, I mean, the idea is exactly the same as before, only that, uh, okay, this problem is not FPT, so for each small set of terminals, uh, or rather each demand graph on a small set of terminals, I just have to use an XP algorithm, but that thing exists, we provide that, and, uh, and uh, so you get sort of asymptotically, you get this running time, okay, and, uh, and yeah, now you can sparsify it and, and get a PSAX. Um, alternatively, you can also just exhaustively go through all these, uh, these pre-computed solutions and find uh, a, a good, uh, the one plus epsilon approximation that the, uh, that the theorem guarantees. So you get a parameterized approximation scheme with this, with this uh, well, this plus this uh, running time. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, can we generalize further? Well, so if we drop the, uh, the condition that the optimum should be planar, then um, we show that there is no parameterized approximation scheme. Uh, and similarly, if we drop the, uh, the uh, condition that the input is bidirected, but we still want a, pl want a planar solution in there, again, 
uh, there is no approximation scheme. In particular, we can even show that there is no 2 minus epsilon approximation for this, uh, for this uh, parameter. Okay, so, so in either of these generalizations, uh, so in some sense, yeah, what I showed you before is really in some sense the limits of what we can do. Um, good, this is just a wrap up. Okay, so these are the tables I showed you before. And here, okay, we get uh, a uh, parameterized approximation scheme with a terrible running time, which is so large it didn't even fit on the slide, so I made it small. Uh, you get a PSAX. Uh, I haven't really thought about this parameter here. You have to be a little bit careful though because, uh, okay, you have to add the number of components in your parameter, definitely, um, because otherwise uh, you, you can't really do anything. Uh, whether you can get any approximations here, uh, I don't know. Okay, and just uh, one more remark. So if you, if you like this uh, topic of parameterized approximations, there's going to be a workshop at uh, ICALP, so if you're there, uh, please come by. And yeah, otherwise, thanks for your attention. Um, well, I'm just thinking, I mean, usually you can, you can always just, I mean, depending on the setting you're in, but I mean, usually you can just assume without loss of generality that the Steiner vertices have degree at least three, right? But taking metric closure. But, but it's unweighted, right? I mean, like, I'm trying to... But, oh, but it's unweighted. Yes, yes. That's why you have to be a little bit careful about the setting, right? But here, um... <coughs> Uh, ba, ba, ba. So I'm guessing, so I definitely, I think in the hardness results, these are anyway the vertices of that have degree three. Uh, so I think, uh, I think, uh, I think either one should be, should be, should be okay. But I would have to check, double check to make sure. Yeah. about the dependency on the Poseidon of everything that you're doing. So I see that a lot of the, um, the complexities depend, like have our double exponential in one over Poseidon because you're essentially iterating over to the one over Poseidon size set yes, due yes. to what was the N2 theorem. So is there any, I, I guess that this is optimum Borges N2 theorem, the two, two one over Correct. Poseidon, Correct. but is there a way of, I don't know, circumventing this by some weaker variant of Borges N2 theorem so that uh, you actually get like two to the, say k to the poly one over Epsilon is axis? Right. So yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, yeah, you're right that in the Bosch and do theorem, definitely you need the exponential in one over epsilon. You cannot, there is an example or yeah, that shows you cannot do better. We don't have any formal uh, proof that maybe you can do something better, get, get uh, only expon single exponential dependency. What I can say though is, and okay, it's again, it's hard to see, okay, but right, what it says here is, so this term here only depends on k and epsilon. This one depends on the input size n and epsilon. So this is, I mean, this is the running time of the approximation scheme, right? What we can show is that dependence is necessary in the sense that uh, you know you cannot hope for like an efficient approximation scheme in the sense that uh, the degree of the polynomial in n has to somehow depend on epsilon. But it could be say n to poly of one. Yes, one yes, 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 yes. Well, part of the story that I'm missing is is the issue of uniformity with respect to epsilon. Is there one single algorithm? At one point, you had a slide up that said there exists a set of H. Now, or do you have a different set of H for each epsilon, or you know where? You mean this one? Is it uniform in epsilon? Do you feed epsilon into the algorithm, and then it all works, or do you have a different algorithm for each epsilon? 
<laughs> right. No, so this depends on epsilon because, I mean, these, uh, the sizes of these uh, things depends on epsilon, right? So for each epsilon, you get like different demand graph, larger demand graph. Or do you have a different algorithm for each? Yeah, yeah, so, so here, right, I mean, the algorithm, uh, the algorithm contains the step, which like for every set of, uh, of uh, size depending on epsilon, actually computes something. So, so the algorithm, yeah, it depends on... So the positive results are uniform in epsilon. So you have only one algorithm, right? In epsilon is an input to the algorithm. Yeah, 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 okay. Epsilon is an input to the, to the algorithm, actually. Yeah, 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 so in that sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you give some more intuition? How planarity creeps in this? Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. How does, uh, okay, so how does it, uh, so there is one step in the, in the proof where we actually use a, a KPR theorem, if you know what that is, Klein, Plotkin, Rao, uh, which is like a, you can cluster uh, planar graphs into, into, um, into pieces so that somehow the boundaries are, are small of these clusters in some sense, okay? Now the thing is, uh, it's an excellent question actually because uh, the KPR theorem is extendable to minor closed graphs. Okay, and the uh, one open question here is whether you can do something like this for minor closed. The thing is that it's a bit annoying because there's one step in this proof where we sort of do some simplification where we, where we um, make every vertex have degree uh, three and things like that which you can do in planar graphs, but not in general minor closed uh, graphs. And somehow getting around this, I mean, it's supposed to be just a simplification step, but I'm, I'm, at the moment I'm not, I don't know how to get around this, right, to generalize this, yeah.